thank you to the organizers for inviting me. Um, and yeah, on this on this point about questions, please feel free to interrupt me. Any any questions, great, including as we were talking about the question, just why why is this true? So okay, I'm going to be talking about sums of two cubes. Um, I'm going to be talking about sums of two rational cubes, but uh, maybe I'll kind of justify why two cubes and rational cubes, etc., in the very beginning. So I'm going to be talking about uh, the point of this talk is going to be to produce lots of integers which are or are not uh, the sum of two rational cubes. So um, at, I guess at first I'm just going to focus on producing lots of integers which are not the sum of two rational cubes. Okay, so uh, well, okay, I'm going to justify why I'm talking about sums of two cubes right now or for a little bit. So barely any integer is a sum of one integer cube or you know even one rational cube that doesn't really change anything. Um, on the other hand, everybody, every integer rational number is a sum of three rational cubes. Um, and you know, here's an identity. You get to pick your favorite y, pick it to be absolutely ginormous so that the denominator doesn't vanish. Oh, I should use the pointer, yeah. Now that I can do that. So the denominator doesn't vanish. And uh, you have a representation of x as a sum of three cubes. Um, and uh, I think a good reference for you know the beautiful geometry involved in Finding this identity, why such an identity should hold, et cetera, uh, is a book by Manion on uh, cubic forms. But anyway, so, okay, every, every integer rational number is a sum of three rational cubes. Um, therefore, anything more than three rational cubes as well. And let's now talk a little bit about sums of three integer cubes. Um, so first off, if I have an element of Z mod nine, its cube is automatically in zero or plus or minus one. So what does that mean? This is a test that my handwriting works. Um, that means that, oh good, sorry. <laughs> X cubed plus Y cubed plus C cubed is in zero plus or minus one, plus or minus two, plus or minus three, mod nine. And in particular, this does not include plus or minus four. Okay, so that gives an obstruction mod nine to being a sum of three integer cubes. Because yeah, when you reduce mod nine, um, you can't be plus or minus four. So that's kind of the obvious obstruction, the only local obstruction there is. And Heath Brown conjectured that if you have an, an integer which avoids that obvious local obstruction, then that integer is a sum of three cubes, which I represented like this because why not? I found uh, the cube macro or something in LaTeX. Okay, so. Um, the immediate thing to ask, and Heath Brown in, within the conjecture conjectured something much more precise. The immediate thing to ask is how many solutions are there? How many ways are there of, of writing n as a sum of three integer cubes? And okay, the natural thing to do is to say, suppose I bound the size of uh, each of the cubes, like if it's x cubed plus y cubed plus z cubed, let's say x, y, and z are bounded by this parameter capital X. So how many solutions do I expect? You expect infinitely many, and not only that, Heath Brown conjectured a precise asymptotic, but the, the point I want to just quick thing I want to quickly point out is the asymptotic, uh, the, the number of solutions of size at most x, let's say, grows like log x. And it's hard to get the circle method or, or kind of the standard ways to um, produce solutions to spit out something like log x. You usually get like polynomial, or at least you know, you could get a in principle log x times polynomial or something, but anyway. That's why I wrote, it's not really a mathematical justification I wrote in quotes, hence the difficulty of the problem. But anyway, you, you, the, the conjecture is you expect infinitely many solutions when you avoid this obvious local obstruction. This is not what the talk's gonna be about. I just, I love writing huge numbers like this. So anyway, so here's a, this was obviously in the news recently. Um, we, all, we all saw it and it's, it's really cool. Um, and I just, you know, I wanted to write uh, the solution. So one, one thing that, that uh, was not known for quite some time was, okay, the number 33. So that when you have such a conjecture, you immediately say, let's search for the you know first couple of numbers, um, search for a solution. And 33 resisted progress, famously, um, and 42 also re resisted progress, but recently uh, Booker and Sutherland found a representation of 42 as a sum of three cubes. And you know, the cubes are just gigantic. But, but they're gigantic, but kind of, you know, the fact that there's a log here um, suggests that you should be, you may get some huge uh, uh, first solution, so to speak. I don't actually know if this is uh, the first solution necessarily. I don't know if it's, that's been shown, but anyway, let's act like it is. 
All right, so that's sums of three integer cubes, a very difficult problem, but uh, very much in the news recently. Um, I'm just gonna talk about two cubes. And uh, the first claim, which I guess is already in the abstract, uh, is just that there aren't really that many integers which are sum of two integer cubes. Um, and yeah, the reason is uh, if, uh, let's just say x cubed, I'm gonna put a minus sign this is obvious, it doesn't matter, but for psychological reasons, x cubed minus y cubed is at most x. Well, this is like x minus y times some positive definite guy. Then, well, okay, the, the point is cubes repel each other. If I had like a y squared minus x cubed for all those who love integer points on Mordell curves, um, well, okay, squares and cubes kind of do repel each other, but that that repulsion comes from Baker's bound for linear forms of logarithms. And yeah, you're not gonna get a great uh, lower bound on the, this sort of difference. But in this case, yeah, cubes really do repel each other very well. So X minus Y is at most this parameter capital X over, I'll just write it like max of little X, and little Y squared. <clears throat> so first off, what does that imply? So if so if this thing was, let's just assume it's non-zero because it's really easy to figure out if zero is the sum of two integer cubes. And that implies, since this difference then is at least one, that implies that uh, the max of these things um, is at most x to the half. So automatically we have like, we have an a priori bound on the size of a representation of a given integer by uh, sum of two cubes, both of the both of the I don't know cube roots or whatever are not really that big, and so yeah, so bound number of x y pairs with max at most, let's say, kind of the the obvious thing x to the one third, because if if I wanted to get some sum of two cubes to be at most like x, well, I could plug in little x and little y of size like x to the one third and yeah, it's of size of most x. So that bound that trivially, trivially meaning, well, how many possibilities are there? How many integers are of the size x to the one third? So there's x to the one third choices for x, x to the one third choices for y. So there's x to the th two thirds choices for those guys uh, together. And, and uh, for the rest, without loss of generality, let's say, oh my goodness. Uh, X is the bigger one. And then, okay, so first you fix the bigger one, in this case, X. And then you say, how many possible Y's are there that, that satisfy this inequality? Well, the number of possible Y's, well, they all sit in some interval of this length. The interval, this, this, this bound has a uh, size at least one, that's from this a priori bound. This is a common mistake, I think, uh, where you say, oh, in a, how many integers are in an interval of size epsilon? Oh, it's at most epsilon. Well, no, you could have one integer in there. Anyway, um, so that loss generality, X is the bigger one. And then the number of possible Y's, Y's is X divided by this squared. So the bound that you get is on the kind of non-trivial solutions is, uh, X to the one third goes up to X to the one half, X divided by X squared. Okay, which is X to two thirds because of this lower bound. All right, good. So I just wanted to, it's like a little elementary dinky thing. Just wanted to uh, put it, get it out of the way. So there aren't that many integers that there's some two cubes, two integer cubes, excuse me. And the, you know, there's not that much multiplicity um, and there aren't that many solutions. So given n, n non-zero, I guess the statement's true for n zero, but anyway, there isn't that much multiplicity among, uh, it, it, there aren't that many representations of n as a sum of two cubes. Um, you can imagine doing this by just factoring and saying, well, this is one of the divisors of n. There aren't that many divisors, for example. And then this is kind of determined up to, x is then determined up to two choices, or you could use a bound of a verte uh, and you know just totally destroy it like that. Okay. so. All right, now I'm gonna to get to the point, which is uh, we're gonna be talking about sums of two rational cubes, having kind of put aside all the other cases. Um, but I wanna just quickly note, 
because you know if you know me you know i love the word effective so anyway if if you give me n do i know how to answer the question of whether or not n is a sum of two for example rational cubes uh in finite time you give me n and you say i'm going to give you a million years to come back with an answer am i confident that i will be able to answer that question within a million years um well if it's two integer cubes then yes okay may I, let me try to scroll back up if it's two integer cubes and this kind of a priori bound tells me there's not that much I have to search. I just search for, you know, I start plugging in all possible values of X and Y, and I either find N as a sum of two integer cubes or I don't. Sum of two rational cubes, well, I'll put it this way. I mean, we do know kind of, but we don't mathematically, you know, provably know um, uh, the, the answer to this question. Uh, so we don't know a, a finite time algorithm that will, given an N, produce a, a representation of N, for example, as a sum of two rational cubes, if there is one, or even just determine if there is one, and then say there is no such um, sum of two rational cubes representation of N if there is none. Well, okay, the reason I said we do kind of know is, we pretty much know is um, this is okay if uh, you assume the finiteness of Sha and or uh, the Birch and Swinner from Dyer conjecture. I guess it's kind of part of the BSD conjecture. Um, and actually, if you look in Tate's, I think it's an ICM address. Anyway, Tate's first writing where he conjectures the finiteness of Shaw, um, he immediately notes, yeah, if you have this finiteness, then you can just run this like iterated uh, higher and higher descent algorithm to uh, <clears throat> to determine the to determine whether or not an elliptic curve. So this thing I should have said earlier to determine whether or not an elliptic curve like this one, this is an elliptic curve because it has a point of infinity, um, has a rational point or not, has an infinite order rational point or not. But the whole this whole question basically is about infinite order rational points. All right, so I, I just like noting that. Now we're gonna get to the actual stuff. All right, so the main theorem of the talk uh, is, th this is joint work with Manjul Bhargava and Ari Schnibben. And the main theorem is that at least a sixth of integers, at least a sixth of integers, um, are not the sum of two rational cubes. And on the other hand, I kind of sneak a factor of half in here, but anyway, on the other hand, at least a sixth of uh, odd integers are the sum of two rational cubes. Okay, so that's what we're gonna be talking about. So in other words, this produces the correct order of magnitude. This doesn't get the, I'll, I'll mention in seconds, this doesn't, this doesn't get the optimal constant. And the, the method will not give the optimal constant um, unless you really improve it very significantly. Um, but anyway, it produces the right order of magnitude for these, these numbers. And I think the, yeah, I'm pretty sure the best lower bounds that were known, so to speak, were both zero. Um, okay, so yeah. So you expect, <clears throat> you expect like a half, half, you expect half of the integers to be a sum of two rational cubes and half of the integers, sorry, not a sum of two rational cubes and half of the integers to actually be a sum of two rational cubes. Um, that's one of these standard uh, heuristics. So, okay, now I'm gonna say something a little bit more about these elliptic curves. So this is a family of elliptic curves. Again, it's, this is you know, smooth cubic in, in P2 when you homogenize. So it's a genus one curve. Okay, when you put a Z cubed here, and set z equals zero, then there's an obvious rational point, one minus one. So this is a family of elliptic curves. Um, these elliptic curves, as we, so to speak, know, but can't prove, the uh, whether or not the elliptic curves have an infinite order rational point, let me just ask you to believe me that there's not interesting torsion um, that will give solutions. So whether or not the elliptic curve has an interesting, <clears throat> has an infinite order rational point is governed by the order of vanishing of its L function at the central point of its functional equation. Okay, so that order of vanishing, certainly um, certainly the, the L function is forced to vanish if the uh, L function is odd around that central point, if the functional equation is an odd functional equation. And so that's like some, whether or not some root number is a minus one or a plus one, that, that sort of statement, what, whether or not the functional equation is odd, and the root number echo distributes. You know, you can actually show it really easily in this family. Um, 
So because the root number actually distributes, okay, half the time the L function is forced to vanish, half the time it's not necessarily forced to vanish. And then, so that's kind of where these halves are coming from. And then kind of 100% of the time, if you give me what the root number is, you expect that the L function shouldn't vanish. And so um, if it's not forced to vanish by root number considerations, 100% of the time, the L function shouldn't vanish. And so the rank should be zero, 100% of the time because of BSD, that, that's the you know crucial relation. And similarly, 100% of the time, the rank should be one because it's forced to vanish once and you know 100% of the time it shouldn't vanish anymore. So that's why this half half um, uh, thing happens. Okay. All right, so now let me get to uh, uh, how do you prove or how do we prove a, uh, a result like this? Okay, so this is gonna be some geometry numbers for uh, a, a while. So, okay, I wrote it like this. Um, let V be, I wrote this kind of strangely, V is the space of pairs of binary cubic forms. So what's a, what's a typical element of V? It's an eight dimensional vector space. Actually, I'm, I'm thinking of it as, an, as a Z to the eight or something. Anyway, um, typical element is, well, it's a binary cubic form or a pair of binary cubic forms. So this is what the elements look like. So there are, let me actually write that. So there are four, sorry, why did I write? I'm trying to write four dimensions, <laughs> three. So there are four uh, coefficients A0 through A3, and there are four coefficients B0 through B3. So you get kind of eight dimensions. And uh, so that's the kind of space in which I'm gonna talk about geometry of numbers. And um, this, the, the relevant group is going to be, so this is gonna be kind of a, a, a arithmetic statistics type discussion for a bit. The relevant group is kind of an SL2 squared. Okay, so how does SL2 squared act? Well, one thing you can do is if you give me two binary cubic forms, I can replace them by like linear combinations. BF2, CF1, oops, plus DF2. Yeah, that's one legitimate thing you can do. You, you start from a pair of binary cubic forms and end with a pair of binary cubic forms. So that's one kind of action of SL2, like on the outside, and in this weird looking notation on this outer two. And then you can also change variables, so to speak, inside the binary cubic form by changing X and Y, by replacing X and Y by a linear combination, pair of linear combinations. Okay, so that's kind of the action on the inside. And uh, well, okay, I kind of hid something here. I wrote like sim lower three. That means it's threes in, so to speak. So whatever, it doesn't matter. These are just constants. You, you include the binomial coefficient. So like the, you have one, three, three, one is a, uh, okay, if the reason doesn't, doesn't make sense, just ignore the constants, but it's like, you know, Gauss's notation for binary quadratic forms. Okay, anyway, so that's the space that I'm gonna be talking about. The threes do matter because we're talking about integer points. So anyway, so G is acting as an SL2 squared in the way I mentioned um, on this space. All right, so I set that up. Okay, so um, let me just mention it's the, the crucial parameterization is the following. So I'm gonna be talking about, let me just hmm, scroll up for a second. So how am I gonna get a result like this? This is something like a lot of these curves, these elliptic curves have rank zero. One way you can show that a lot of these curves have rank zero is, well, you know that, um, let me write it like this, two to the rank of the curve is bounded by, bounded above by, the size of the two Selman group of this elliptic curve. So how do you get lots of curves with rank zero? Well, you, you can try to get lots of two Selman groups that are of size one, that are trivial. And how are you gonna get lots of two Selman groups that are of size one? Well, it's like this probabilistic method thing. You can show maybe the average, is, average size is not really that big. So, I'm gonna start by, so to speak, talking about how do you try to do that. So you're trying to show the average size of some two Selma groups is not that big. And apparently I'm gonna talk about two Selma groups 
of these elliptic curves. And in, in a second, in a bit, um, connect the two. But okay, so I'm talking, I'm gonna talk only about two Selmer elements of these elliptic curves for a bit. So if you give me such an elliptic curve, this two Selmer group is something. And to find the two Selmer elements, um, you can go instead and look for pairs of binary cubic forms, this space that I just talked about. And if you give me this particular elliptic curve, so it has two coefficients that are allowed to vary, a2, so to speak, and a6, just notation. Um, the two Selmer elements are in bijection with pairs of binary cubic forms with those given in, with given invariants. So it turns out that the space of binary cubic forms, uh, we'll write this pairs of binary cubic forms. Maybe I'll write it like this, just understand what I'm writing, I guess. So if I take polynomial invariants, polynomials in, um, in these coefficients, AI and BI, that are invariant under the action of G, um, then that's generated by, turns out just two invariants and no relations between them. And the two invariants, the notation suggests, this one has degree two and this one has degree six. I'm actually gonna write this invariant down in a sec, but I'm not gonna write this degree six invariant down. Um, so, okay, two cellular elements of these elliptic curves are in bijection with pairs of binary cubic forms, integer coefficients, with given invariants, and then there's this condition of local solubility. Okay, so actually take those, and if you have such a thing with given invariants, well, it's obvious that you can change variables by like SL2Z cross SL2Z, because these are supposed to be invariants for the action of this group. Um, so you'd get, inf you get an infinite answer here. So, okay, it can't possibly even by be even bijection with this two summer group. So you have to mod out by equivalence under uh, the rational points of this group, G of Q. Okay, that's not so deadly. Just imagine I'm saying mod out by SL2Z cross SL2Z. It's pretty much the same thing. All right, and then there's this local solubility condition. Well, in the, in the definition of the two summer group as some Galois cohomology classes that are locally soluble, da, da, da. Uh, you know, it has a local solubility um, condition there and there's that same condition here, All right? But anyway, just basically imagine that two summer elements are pairs of binary cubic forms with an integer coefficients. Um, from that, these are theorems of Bar Manjul Bhargava and Wei Ho, also a theorem of Manjul Bhargava and Wei Ho in a, in a different paper. Um, from that, you get, or they got eventually after, after more work, um, that the average size of two Selma groups in this family of elliptic curves, which I still haven't connected to the family we care about in this talk, um, is at most three. Okay, so it's just, anyway, they got, they got some uh, bound for the average size of two Selma groups in this family using this parameterization. I'm gonna talk very quickly about uh, how uh, the parameterization allows you to prove something like this. Because you know, if you imagine trying to do this by saying, oh, I'm, I'm gonna look at Galois cohomology classes and impose local solubility, et cetera, et cetera, I don't know where you'd get started. But this is kind of a much more concrete object that you might be able to count. Okay, so let's talk about that. So how do you, how can you possibly uh, get a bound on the average size of these two summer groups? How can you possibly get this, this clean bound three? So roughly speaking, um, once you parameterize things by binary cubic forms, very concrete objects, you use G, it's like kind of SL2 cross, SL2Z cross SL2Z, to put all the binary cubic forms you're trying to count, you're trying to deal with in some decent normal form, and now, so for example, decent normal form would mean like you're trying to count pairs of binary cubic forms. What you don't want to have to try to count is binary cubic forms, pairs of binary cubic forms where all the coefficients are like one or two, and then one of the coefficients, only one of the coefficients is allowed to be like a trillion. You don't want to try to count those things kind of on average because that's that's going to live in some horrible set um, that whose integer points you cannot count easily by saying, oh, they're almost the volume. The number of integer points is almost the volume. So anyway, you, you see this kind of in, in Gauss's work where he, he tries to he uses this is called reduction theory. He uses SL2Z to change variables so that his binary quadratic forms are, are decent. They, they satisfy some clean inequalities and then he's able to count them. Um, yes, yeah, so I guess I should have mentioned this. This is a universal, sorry. This family of elliptic curves is a universal family of elliptic curves with a Mark III torsion point, namely, x equals y equals zero. 
I should have mentioned that there's an obvious point on these elliptic curves and that point turns out to be three torsion. So yeah, anyway, so the counting goes by, okay, you figure out how to change variables just by kind of theories of fundamental domains, how to change variables to put the relevant um, concrete objects into a decent form and then count, count integer points in, in decent sets. And I'm just gonna kind of put down in the like main integral that you face or main point counting problem that you face. You don't really need to know, I'm not gonna explain all the notation because you don't need to know it. I'm just gonna explain like what you need to, the problem that you really need to think about. Okay, so, all right, so how to do this. All right, so, okay, first the usual, I'm gonna draw like a usual picture of um, the fundamental domain for SL2Z acting on the upper half plane. And I'm just gonna put two things down. It's kind of like a U and like T, which is like T squared. So, um, okay. I have like a pair of, you, sorry, sorry, sorry. I have a pair of like um, unipotent elements. So there's like a unipotent part of uh, SL2 and there's a, a torus. This is kind of my notation. You don't really need to know this notation, but just to kind of give you an idea, this is this is stuff going on in the group. Inverse T2. Um, okay, so kind of what's going on is lambda is gonna be like scalars. These U's are gonna be like um, unipotent elements and these T's are gonna be like the uh, torus. And we're kind of writing SL2, so ignoring lambda, we're kind of writing SL2 it is like the NAK decomposition because K is compact. I can just act like it doesn't exist. So N is like the, the used and A is like the torus, it's like the T's. All right, so the, the, but now you can just kind of ignore that. It's just some integral. I'm gonna tell you in a very concrete way what you really have to count. So you're really trying to count the number of points, number of, uh, let me write it F and V, no, no, no. Number of, a zero, a zero dot, 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 a three, nope. B zero, B three, and Z to the eight, such that, okay, it's inequalities like this. A zero is at most like lambda times T one to the minus uh, three. A one is like, at most like lambda times T one inverse. Um, I'll just write the, the general inequality down in a sec. B zero is the most like lambda times T two to the minus three, et cetera. So the, the, the inequalities are actually, this is basically the counting problem. You're gonna have to trust me that it's actually, it's a three, sorry. Minus three plus two I. So you're trying to count integers in this region, this is, I mean, obviously this is, it's like significantly more difficult, but kind of given the techniques that we know now, this is the intuitively correct thing to, to think about um, if you trust me. So you're trying to count integers, uh, eight tubules of integers that satisfy these inequalities. Let me actually color them in. Um, so they, they satisfy these inequalities. Okay, and the T's kind of, uh, each ti is most like lambda to the one third, just so the right-hand sides of these inequalities are always at least one. <clears throat> because I guaranteed that, and lambda is kind of the big parameter, just think of it like that's the, the relevant big parameter and you can forget about any, everything else that happened before. It's easy to count integer points in this kind of box. Okay, so that's intuitively, you're you're reducing, obviously it's it's, in reality, more difficult, but intuitively speaking, you're you're reducing to counting integer points after a lot of rigmarole in some um, box, which is potentially skew. And t the the t parameters kind of control how skew the box is. So, like you know, if t were huge, then a zero would be ranging over some kind of small interval, but a one is ranging over a bigger interval, and then the later ones are ranging over a much larger interval. Um, so, but still, you can count integer points in a skew box by saying, okay, there it's, you know, roughly the volume of the box or alternatively you count points in an integer points interval, 
by saying roughly it's the length of the interval. Okay, so that's intuitively speaking, that's how you should think of it. You kind of have to integrate these point counts, whatever, over uh, over lambda u and t, and you can kind of just ignore u. Just just yeah. Basically, the issue is integrating over lambda and these these smoothness parameters. All right, so now I'm going to like put that aside for a sec and um, explain to you quickly because we're going to come back to this in a second. I'm going to explain to you quickly what this counting problem had to do with our problem. Okay, so what why do these elliptic curves? You know, what do they have to do with what we are trying to do? Okay, so the the family of elliptic curves we're actually interested in is this family x plus y cubed equals n. N varies. Um, that's an elliptic curve. May as well put it in Weierstrass form. The Weierstrass form is y squared equals x cubed minus 432 n squared, kind of famously. And so it's a Mordell curve. And anytime you have a Mordell curve, y squared equals x cubed plus k, that's three isogenous to y squared equals x cubed minus 27k. So what this teaches you, this three isogeny, okay, where does it come from? It comes from um, if you take x equals zero, then there's like a complex, sorry, a Galois conjugate pair of um, of rational points, y equals plus or minus the square root of k. And those are both three torsion points. And so along with the identity point, that gives you a, a, a subgroup, a Z mod three subgroup stabilized by the Galois group. Preserve, I don't know how to say it, uh, kept inside itself, so to speak, by the Galois group. So that's it's a rational subgroup. And so you can mod out by it and you get an isogenous slip to curve. Here it is. So what this teaches you is that you know you, this 432, for some reason, maybe doesn't look uh, satisfying to you. You can eat any factors of minus 27 with a three isogeny. So okay, this this the elliptic curve family that we're interested in is three isogenous to this family. Y squared equals x cubed plus I, I brought the four inside four n quantity squared. Okay, and now you can kind of uncomplete the square to write it in the form that we were just talking about. So I'm going to write it as y squared is zero times x y plus eight n times y is equal to y squared plus that is equal to x cubed. All right, so this is kind of the form that we were talking about before. So remember the coefficients are like zero and eight n. So I'm going to just scroll up to show you so if you don't believe me. Y squared plus a two x y plus a six y is equal to x cubed. So these elliptic curve family are the same as this elliptic curve family we're interested in is the same as before, except all of them have this a2 equals zero, okay? But like kind of forget about the eight, you know, these, these sorts of congruence conditions don't matter. So roughly this parameter is allowed to vary arbitrarily, but um, we're varying in this, in this family where we restricted one of these um, AIs to be zero. So we, you know, what we are going to be interested in is to get an average, a bound on the average size of these two summer groups in our family, and to do that, well, we could try to run this parameterize, put a normal form count argument um, for this family. But what would we face if we did that? We would face, um, well, okay. So we would be trying to do Bargava and Ho's work for our curves, but to do that, we would have to impose, so A2 was like the value of this quadratic invariant on the pair of binary cubic forms in that parameterization. So to do that, we would have to impose the equation that the quadratic invariant vanishes um, for all the pairs of binary cubic forms that we're interested in. Um, I'm gonna write it down, but that's a you know, catchphrase maybe, quadric and arithmetic statistics. Okay, so the, imagine, now I'm gonna write down the, um, the quadratic invariant. I'll just write AI, let's forget about the factors of three. X to the I, Y to the three minus I. So on pi, x to the i, y to the three minus i. Yeah, so what is this i2 on this pair of binary cubic forms? I hope I've been saying binary cubic instead of binary cubic forms. Um, it's the following thing. There's always an invariant bilinear form on, um, on the space of binary nx, I think. So maybe n should be odd, let's just say, just to be safe, because um, I don't want to think about it. But anyway, here it is for n is three. M A I B three minus I. So this is kind of like A zero B three minus A one times three, sorry. A one B two plus dot, dot, dot. Yeah, so this is a quadratic form. 
um, in the in the A's and B's. Okay, so let me just go back to that integral we were facing. We're going to try to run Fargo Ho's argument, but with this extra condition imposed that all the invariance, the quadratic invariance of all the pairs of binary cubic forms that we are that we're trying to count have to vanish. Um, so we have to impose this kind of equation in our inside the counting argument. Uh, so I just kind of rewrote the exact same integral as before, except I added this condition. Okay, so now remember that this set, again, this looks like some mess, but this set was basically like a zero through this, you know, eight tuples of integers, um, the AIs were like allowed to be skew by T1 was allowing them to be skew and the BIs, well, T2 was allowing them to be skew. And, and now we have to also impose that I2 of A's and B's is zero. Okay, so we're trying to count inside this kind of box, which potentially is skew. The number of solutions, integer points on this quadric, um, this very explicit quadric. And that's not a problem if it, the box is not skew. It, you know, it can even be a little bit skew. It's, it's easy. I mean, yeah, from the analytic perspective, you have eight variables and you're trying to count integer points on a quadric. That's like a, by now, that's like a joke for the circle method. Okay, so it's, if, it's, if the box is not skew at all, like if the t's are like a lambda to the epsilon, lambda, just forget about now the integral. Lambda is our big parameter, so to speak. If the t's are not, that big so that the box is not really that skew, uh, then yeah, the circle method says, oh yeah, you have a, a degree two polynomial and eight variables. Of course I can count the, the number of um, uh, solutions. Asymptotically, you get your beautiful product of local densities. You get the correct asymptotic, you get a power saving error term. Everything's great. <clears throat> but that's, yeah, so anyway, that's so to speak, not that high in the cost. Remember there was this kind of, oh, I, I drew the picture and I never actually went back to it, but. Sorry, this ugly picture that I drew. Um, yeah, let me just say the U parameter is kind of the real part parameter and T is kind of like telling you how high you are in the cusp. So if you're not that high in the cusp, you're allowed to be like sub polynomial high in the cusp. And actually it'll work if you went up to like lambda to the 10 to the minus 10 or something, lambda to the 0.01 or whatever. Um, if you went that high, then the circle method would still be fine and still you know, laugh and produce the, the correct answer. Now, if you are, if your box is skew, you're not in such bad shape either. This is one beautiful um, thing about trying to count integer points on quadrics. You can get down to almost the correct asymptotic by doing nothing. So um, here's our quadric. It doesn't really matter that it has this beautiful form, but anyway, a0, b3, minus 3, a1, b2, plus 3, a2, b1, minus a3, b0, that's supposed to be equal zero, yeah? So we can get down to the correct, so let me just ex explain to you what you expect. So each of the AIs, let's act like each of the AIs, even though I keep talking about the skewness business, each of the AIs and BIs are roughly size lambda, okay? So you have kind of eight things of size lambda, the possibility, number of possibilities like lambda to the eighth, the left-hand side is of size like lambda squared. So what are the chances that this left-hand side of size lambda squared is the number, the single number zero? Well, probably like lambda to the minus two. So you expect, so the circle method will give like constant product of local densities times lambda to the eighth times this probability, lambda to the minus two, so you get lambda to the sixth. Okay, so that's the expected size, number of solutions. You so to speak save two variables when you have a quadric and if, if you had a degree n polynomial, you would expect to save n variables if you had like tons of um, tons of uh, variables. So anyway, in this case, you expect like a lambda to the sixth many solutions. And that's what saving two minus like epsilon variables means. You can get easily, um, so, so number of solutions, ignoring skewness or whatever, is it always at most lambda to the six plus epsilon? Why? Well, let's fix 
six particular variables. Fix everybody but these two variables, A1 through A3, B2, sorry, B0 through B2. In other words, let's just fix this part of the quadrant. All right, so then the equation is the product of these two variables is some kind of constant that we've fixed. I, I, I'm gonna hide the word non-trivial, but for those who notice this subtlety, that's how we, I get around it. So um, the number of divisors of a fixed integer is like, a, like if the integer is, is n, it's like n to the epsilon, the divisor bound. Um, anyway, yeah, that's, that's how many divisors there are. And a0 and b3 are both divisors of this integer. So there's n to the epsilon many choices, this to the epsilon many choices for a0 and this to the epsilon many choices for b3. So that's how you get lambda to the epsilon many choices for a0 and b3 given the other six variables. So the number of possibilities is certainly at most lambda to the six plus epsilon. Okay, so um, it's easy to save. It's easy to kind of almost get down to the correct asymptotic without doing any work. So that you get down to the number of solutions is at most like lambda to the six plus epsilon, whether or not the, the box is skew. And that's actually enough. Um, you don't have to do anything if the box really was skew because we're not, we're not actually trying to get the asymptotic for every single one of these point counts. We're just trying to get the asymptotic for the integral of these point counts. And um, yeah, let me just say, if you imagine integrating, how to say this? Hmm. Anyway, if you, let me just say it quickly. If you are following and then if you're not following, it's okay. But if you imagine like integrating, yeah, if you imagine integrating here and putting a lambda to the you know, 0 0.01 or something, then the integral is converging so quickly because these like ti's to the minus two are way more than you need for convergence of the integral. So the integral is converging so quickly, like power savingsly quickly, that even though you lost an epsilon on the asymptotic, you're going to gain it back from the, the integration. And so that, that's going to tell you that, that, that the part where the boxes are skew is inside the error term. Okay, so anyway, a little bit of a, a use of the fact that we're averaging the point counts. All right, so let me just keep moving because um, maybe that's a bit technical getting inside that. So the result is that you can run the Bargava-Ho argument in this family too. And we get that the average size of two Selma groups of these elliptic curves, um, x cubed plus y cubed equals n, that average is also three. And I, I mean, I wrote the average over all integers, but just like in kind of all these um, geometry numbers, type theorems, you can impose finitely many congruence conditions, no problem. So for example, you could say N is divisible by, you know, 1729 or something, okay? Or N is congruent to one mod 691. Um, but, okay, so I, now we're gonna get back to this. Can you restrict to N prime? That's a fantastic question. Um, I'm gonna say no, not in this argument, certainly. And if you restrict to N prime, um, there's, uh, let me try to, oh man. Okay, I don't remember about like the exact congruence classes. Maybe I should avoid like one mod nine. No, anyway, I don't know. But um, there's work of Sylvester, which does the, uh, a descent on these curves. And, um, and anyway, I'm gonna avoid that question, but, but not in the argument. You can't restrict to N prime in the argument. Um, quickly, why you'd be trying to say count points on a quadric, but also um, the degree six invariant you'd be like multiplying by Mobius of a degree six polynomial. And I'm scared of doing Mobius of any polynomial. That's not like, I'm scared of doing Mobius of a linear polynomial, but not that scared, but definitely scared of doing Mobius of a degree six polynomial. So that's, that's kind of what you'd have to face. And that's the reason I think, no, uh, you can't face that at least at the moment um, in the argument, but that's a great question. And, and I, I'm gonna just refer to you, refer you to, um, Sylvester's work and his conjecture, but I'm, I don't know much more than the fact that Sylvester um, is involved. So, okay, so, but even restricting to all integers or not restricting, but running over all integers, we get the average size of two summer is three. So let me just, we were trying to produce lots of um, ends for which this is a one and two summer, the size of two summer. Well, it's a power of two always. So it's like a one, two, four, eight, you know, these possibilities. 
And if so, we get some average of these powers of two, which is a three. But that's not good enough to produce lots of ones because everybody could have been a two and a four, for example. You could have like 50% twos and 50% fours. And, and so we produced no, just looking at this and staring at it, we produced no, um, nobody who, not, not, not necessarily anybody who has a trivial two solar group. And therefore, we're not produced, we don't necessarily just by staring at this produce any um, of these elliptic curves having lots of elliptic curves having rank zero. So three is not small enough for the, uh, for the conclusion, but, but it's, you know, this, this bound is the truth. So what are we gonna do? Um, we're now gonna look at root numbers, okay? So I'm gonna explain in a second why we're gonna look at root numbers, but let me just mention that I think the right people to cite are Rorlick and um, really Alvarado. The problem is I don't remember where the accents go, but Anyway, Rorlick and um, Varelia Alvarado, which says that uh, the work, that work says that the root number of xq plus y cubed equals n, our beautiful elliptic curves, is, I'm gonna use garbage in a technical sense right now, garbage at two and three, which I'm just gonna ignore, times roughly, so, times minus one to the number of prime factors dividing n, which are um, two mod threes. So that minus one to the, so the parity of the number of prime factors not parity of the number of two mod threes dividing in. And uh, this is, let me just note without multiplicity, it really is the count of the number of primes. So for example, if N is square free, so that, that multiplicity comment I just made, you can ignore that then. If N is square free and we ignore the garbage of two and three, then this function minus one to the number of two mod threes, well, that's just N mod three. That's, you know, here's another, a better way to compute that function. You compute N mod three because yeah, prime factorize, and you, you really are two is minus one mod three. So, okay. So let me just say it like this. Root, the root number is like n mod three. The real thing I should be saying is, um, because you to take into account the garbage of two and three, if n is square free, and, and you can impose a congruence mod, I think nine. I You see, I'm always, I always try to be safe by writing everything ridiculous 10 to the tens everywhere, but I think you can impose a congruence mod nine. If not, you can impose a congruence mod this finite large quantity. Um, you can impose a congruence mod nine that, that lets you, um, that, that forces the root number to all be plus ones or, or be minus ones. Okay, so, but let's ignore the garbage of two and three, and then we can just impose a congruence mod three on n, so long as it's square free, and then the root number is forced to be um, plus one. So. Let me write it, I wrote it here. So we can restrict, restrict to root number plus one curves by imposing congruence conditions. Okay, infinitely many congruence conditions. Cause yeah, you impose like N mod three, but then you have to impose the congruence condition N is square free. So that's infinitely many congruence conditions because you're saying at each prime, P squared is not dividing you. Okay, but, but at least they're congruence conditions. So if I did the full, so to speak, full family of elliptic curves, whoops then what's the root number? It's like, if I remember right, it's like you take the discriminant of this, so some kind of polynomial in A and B, like a, a polynomial like A cubed and B squared. You take the discriminant of that and you look at like the parity of the number of prime factors of the discriminant of, the, of this uh, elliptic curve. And that's kind of a much crazier function to try to face than, uh, than just looking at, or anyway, it's, it's you know much crazier to face that than just try to impose the Congress conditions at N is square free. So, as family, some you know a miracle has kind of happened. Um, so now we're, I'm going to talk about quickly why imposing these infinitely many congruence conditions is not really an issue because they're congruence conditions, All right? So why? So imagine so b is like b is like imagine my set of square free numbers ends. Forget about this congruence condition mod three because I'm going to talk about you know why imposing congruence conditions is not such an issue. So just imagine b is like square freeze. So we, got, we have to impose infinitely many congruence conditions. And I told you before that, I'm gonna scroll up, scroll back down in a sec. I told you before that in this average, yeah, I wrote N is running over Z, but I could have imposed finitely many congruence conditions if I so desired. And I would have still gotten an average of three. This three is not really, you know, it doesn't care about the congruence conditions. The three is coming from the one identity element, which is always there and like a two from the Tamagawa number of a group. So I wrote, remember SL2 squared mod mu2, the size of that mu2 is the two. So anyway, that's where the three comes from. It does not care about the congruence conditions. So, so going back, 
So B is my kind of set of square free integers. I'm trying to average the size of two Selmer over that set of square free integers, imagine. And I can, I can imagine trying to impose only the first trillion congruence conditions. So I can cut off the, the kind of imposition of congruence conditions um, at some parameter T. And let's see how this affects the average. So the average, okay, it's a numerator divided by a denominator. The numerator, I'm averaging you know, a non-negative quantity. The numerator can only go up if I increase the set, yeah? If, if I take the all square free integers, well, they certainly sit inside the integers which are square free at the first million primes. Well, that's a larger set. And so the, the, the numerator goes up um, when I, uh, yeah, so I can, I can upper bound the numerator by the, the numerator for the cutoff set, but I know how to count the denominator correctly. And, and the denominator is like with an epsilon of the denominator for the cutoff set. So what I learn is that the average of this two Selmer or whatever non-negative quantity I want is asymptotically, you know, the limit of the averages of, um, of in this case, two Selmer over the cutoff sets. But all those averages are three. They don't move when I impose congruence conditions. So what I learn is that the average size of two Selmer is also at most three over curves with constant root number. So root number plus one, root number minus one, because to impose the, the fact that the root number is plus one is it's congruent conditions. All right, so why is that relevant? Well, it's relevant because of a theorem of, I'm gonna try to pronounce this correctly, Nikovarge and um, Dokchitzer, Dokchitzer, maybe Dokchitzer and Dokchitzer, I don't know. People please correct my pronunciation after the book because I'm actually really interested in how to pronounce this. Anyway, Nikovarge and Dokchitzer and Dokchitzer, that um, the reason it's relevant is that the root number is controlling the, kind of two Selmer rank, the parity of the two Selmer rank. It's a theorem, a very serious theorem. I wrote it very strangely maybe. So if the root number is like plus one, oops. Okay, so like, you know, this is like minus one to the, minus one to the that is the root number. Hopefully that makes sense now. That's like a, something defined mod two. And uh, this is like, you know, two Selmer is a power of two, which power of two? So the parity of the root number controls the, parity of the two Selmer rank, okay? Given this theorem, three is now small enough. Yeah, because I just explained, if I average over a root number equal to plus one curves, which I can, for example, I can average over the family where n is square free and n is given like mod nine or something. If I average the size of two Selmer, well, that's three or at most three. Anyway, it follows it's three, but, and now or in that family, the size of two Selmer is not just any power of two, it's kind of an even power, uh, even power of two doesn't make sense, two to an even even number. So one, four and bigger. Yeah, and if I have an average of ones, fours and bigger that manages to be three, well, there have to be plenty of ones. So that's why three is small enough. We kind of improved our situation by just doing this one bit of uh, root number analysis. All right, so three is small enough. So I'm just gonna say, Hopefully it makes sense how we uh, conclude. The average is at most three. Two Selmer size is, is always um, one, four. In this family, it's either one, four or larger. And so since the average is three, there must be a decent proportion of ones. And because the two Selmer size being one implies that the rank is zero, that means that these that there are plenty of Ns in this family, but that's a positive proportion subfamily. Plenty of Ns where the rank is zero and therefore there's no solution for uh, of x cubed plus y cubed equals n in the rational numbers. All right, so that ends the kind of rank zero production. And now how do we produce things of rank one? Let me just note, I could have also done the same argument with uh, root number is minus one. Since this average is at most three with the minus one root number guys, and their summer groups have size in now two, eight, so to speak, odd powers of two, if that makes sense. Um, again, three is small enough for them too, because you know it's an average of twos, eights, and bigger. And for the average to be at most three, there have to be plenty of twos. So what this teaches us is that there are plenty of ends for which the two summer size is two. In other words, there are plenty of ends for which the two summer group is, is a Z mod two. 
we want to conclude that, that that means that there's a, a rational point on the uh, elliptic curve. So I'm going to write this a little higher. So yeah, I'll do it on this slide. So two, Shaw two, zero. It's like the defining exact sequence of Shaw. So we conclude that there are plenty of ends for which um, the two summer group is like a Z mod two. If we knew that the Tate Shaw Farevich group is was finite, then if we knew that this thing, the Tate Shaw Farevich group was finite, then this thing would be a square as a group from like the Castle State pairing being alternating. So this is like a square as a group. So how could it possibly contribute to only a Z mod two? It would have to contribute at least a Z mod two squared if, if this thing were non zero. So if we knew that Shaw was finite, we conclude that this is zero. And actually this Z mod two was coming from the, so to speak, rank part. So, so we would conclude that there's actually a point. We, yeah, I don't know how to prove Shaw is finite, but um, there, there are people who know in these situations how to prove Shaw is finite. And so we use uh, a theorem of uh, Ashe Burungale and Christopher Skinner that, uh, th that is as follows. So a P be a prime number, it's really crucial. And these are like technical issues in, the, in, in, uh, in these techniques. Not that I have any expertise whatsoever on them, but anyway, they are, I'm gonna mention the two key technical issues that they overcome. So let P be a prime number, P being allowed to be two is the key for us and they do allow it. And let E be CM with, well, okay, in our case, the, the elliptic curves have good reduction. So N odd gives it, you know, X cubed plus Y cubed equals N certainly has good reduction. It reduces to X cubed plus Y cubed is one. But the reduction is super singular. And that's a, that's a key technical issue um, in these techniques too. Yeah, you can count very easily the number of solutions to X cubed plus Y cubed equals one mod in, over F2. And you'll find it's a super singular elliptic curve. So the, re the reduction is super singular. The reduction at, at P, so P is R2. Um, it's super singular, that's an issue. So, okay, such that the, these two hypotheses hold. So the P Selmer groups, in our case, the two Selmer group is like a Z mod P. You can just ignore torsion because there's, in our case, there's not interesting torsion. So the two Selmer group is like a Z mod two. And there's this extra condition that the image of this two Selmer group, now I have to mention um, these elliptic curves, X cubed plus Y cubed, equals N are all isomorphic over Q2 because I write it strangely, but anyway, um, everybody is a cube in every unit in Z2 in Z is a cube. Just a fact, you know, everything's a cube in F2. So um, because of that, because that means all Ns are cubes in, you know, uh, twoadically. And so because of that, they're all isomorphic to the, the curve X equals Y cubed is one. So kind of, over Q2, this thing is like some kind of constant group, size like uh, four, two, something like that. Um, so, so yeah, just, I wanna note that because I'm gonna say something about it in a second. So anyway, the image of this localization map at two, so if you have an element of the two summer group, um, when you localize, you get something solvable. So it's, it lands in here. That image is not contained in the image of the local two, uh, local two torch, but whatever, that's some condition. Then they can prove, then they do prove that the rank is one, Shaw is finite, the analytic rank is one. And anyway, enough for us to conclude, that we, we certainly conclude that there's a solution. Um, so yeah, now I, I uh, yeah, I'm gonna conclude on this slide. I just wanna say that this condition is kind of weird looking, but it's not such a problem for us because it's some local condition at two. This group is not moving, this group is moving. And um, we can just prove because we weren't counting only Selmer elements, we, we actually started counting pairs of binary cubic forms and, and then imposed congruence conditions. So we can, we can prove that instead of sieving to locally soluble forms, we sieve to, you know, we impose different congruence conditions. We can prove that the image of this group echo distributes inside this kind of fixed guy. And, uh, and so in particular, the, the, we, there are plenty of ends for which the image is not contained in, in, this, um, in this subgroup. That's all I wanted to say. I'm just gonna end by putting this slide up. Um, and uh, thank you.